It is August 23rd, 2017. We're here in Brookhaven, Georgia. My name is Ashton Ellett, and this is the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. And we're speaking today with Brian Robinson of Robinson Republic, um, discussing the rise of the Republican Party and, and contemporary Georgia politics. Um, if you don't mind, go ahead and give us the 30-second, one-minute biography of Brian Robinson. Well, after finishing at the University of Georgia in 1997, I spent five years as a copy editor at the AJC, the last three years on the uh, editorial board's copy desk, and then went from there to uh, working on Capitol Hill for Phil Gingrey when he first got elected from the old 11th district in, in uh, the 2002 election. Uh, did one term with him, and then in 2004, my college roommate's dad, uh, a guy named Lynn Westmoreland, who had played a major role in the rise of the Republican House majority in the state level, won a seat in Congress in the 3rd District, and so I went to work for him, and I was there with him through some of the worst times in uh, Republican history nationally, you know, six when we lost the majority, in 08 when we lost the Senate and White House, uh, through the Great Recessions, uh, and then in 2010, I left. Uh, Congressman Westmoreland had endorsed Nathan Deal, yeah, a friend of his, and uh, Lynn loaned me to Congressman Deal to come down and do his campaign. I was hungry to do it. I was 34 by then and, and w wanted to come home, wanted to be involved in a statewide race, which I never had the chance to do. And I got there at the end of March, 2010, kind of the week that Obamacare passed the U.S. House, to put it in historical perspective. And um, the first day that I was there, the Office of Congressional Ethics issued a report saying Nathan Dill had used his office to enrich himself. And so that kind of became the framework for a really tough campaign. We won the runoff by 3,000 votes thereabouts and then went on to stop Roy Barnes in November, and uh, I was with him for five and a half years. I did a reelect too. I was a deputy chief of staff in the governor's office, and today I have my own business. I consult with political campaigns, Republican political campaigns. I do political commentary in Atlanta and on cable news a lot, and most of my company revenue though comes from issue advocacy, corporate work, um, strategy, communications, uh, and it's a, a, a dab of crisis communications and, and traditional PR. So it's it's not an unusual track to go from journalism to politics. Um, David Axelrod was 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 you know, on the Democratic side the same way. Um, but how did you go from copy editor AJC into political campaigns instead of just covering political campaigns? Well, you know, I wasn't a reporter. I was a copy editor. So I was never actually out in the field. I, I, I would hate reporting. I would hate being on the phone all day. It was just never for me. I'm a word guy. I'm, uh, I, I am a writer, but I, copy editing was a good fit for me. But I was 27 years old, 26, 27. Uh, to my eternal credit, I saw what was coming in the industry with the collapse of classified advertising in a web-driven world where you can do it for much, much uh, cheaper. And I really got out of the industry about three or four years before they started having their major layoffs and stuff. So, I mean, to my credit, I, I saw it coming and I've always loved politics. I would have been in politics all along. I was a volunteer in 1994 when I was at UGA. I was I handed out pamphlets on Sanford Bridge before a football games for uh, I, a challenger named Charlie Norwood, who went on to spend many mm -hmm. years in Congress. I stuffed envelopes for him at his office on Millage Avenue, ran packages back to Augusta. So I was involved. I just did not understand, uh, because I'm not from a political family, and I'm not from a wealthy family, I'm not from a connected family. I didn't understand how you had a career in politics. I understood how you got a degree that gave you a job in journalism, and you got a paycheck in, in return for your skills. I didn't understand how it worked in politics, and that was why there's this five-year gap where I'm in journalism because I didn't, I didn't know enough to do what my true passion was. And you're from Augusta originally. You're an Augusta native. Travel to, like anybody. Okay, so 
always been a Republican, or was that a a a, a a conversion later on, sort of like the state, or born and bred Republican? You know, my dad is a Southern, now retired, but he was a Southern Baptist minister. And we grew up in a rural area of South Carolina. My parents are from Augusta, and we moved back when I was in okay. high school. Um, and so where I grew up in the Black Belt of the South, you know, the, the you know, I was born in 1975, so it was right after the vestiges of segregation mm -hmm where segregation was most strictly enforced, uh, were beginning to come down. But schools were still separate, churches certainly separate, little leagues were separate. I mean, it was, it was um, that was the way I grew up. It, when you're a kid, you don't know any different. And, uh, but the white people, who were a distinct minority where I grew up, were uh, increasingly Republican. Now, they probably voted for Democrats on the state and local level because that's all there was. But they voted for Reagan and then they voted for Bush and, and they voted for Carol Campbell and Tommy Hartnett and, and Strom Thurmond. So there was, I grew up in a very Republican school, in a very Republican church. So, and I grew up thinking pretty hard right, you know, and with the anger that I think has been, has bubbled up with the Trump voters, uh, Pat Buchanan's candidacy in 1992 spoke to me as a 16 year old you know that that we were misunderstood we were mistreated we were looked down upon and uh, i grew out of that uh i got i got to georgia to university of georgia and moderated significantly because i was exposed to ideas and people that i had never seen before and i definitely became much more of a centrist and the views that i developed there have been my views for 25 years now Okay, so what have you? What did you take from your your experiences on Capitol Hill, um, and how did you translate those experiences, those skills, and apply them at the state level during during that two thousand ten campaign? You know, uh, it's it's a very different ball game because the media, particularly uh, in the landscape we have today, where it's a continuing decline of of media and continuing decline of political coverage. Decline how? How are you defining it? When I started to work at the AJC in 1997, right out of UGA, I was the youngest person, the youngest journalist, in a 500 plus person newsroom. Today, that outlet, which is still the largest in the state of Georgia, is down to about 130 journalists. So you've seen a complete decimation of a news gathering force, the largest in the state. They had uh, numerous uh, TV stations here had people in D.C. who would send them stories back from the congressional delegation. Uh, AJC and Cox had a huge bureau in Washington. That's gone now. The AJC has one person up there. Uh, Cox has one person doing WSB stuff who feeds to a lot of different stations. But that's it. And you can send news releases out all day from Capitol Hill, and even if you're Johnny Isaacson and David Perdue. Yeah, there's not a lot of interest. Um, whereas when I got down to Georgia for the, the 2010 campaign, it was instead of being out pitching stories and trying to get coverage for your congressman, it was managing the incoming. And in, in 2010, I was on the phone literally all day, every day, just in a, in a brawl with the media. They were, it was not... It was not paranoia. They were out to get us. All of them thought that they were going to win the Pulitzer Prize bringing down this criminal Nathan Deal. And at the end of the day, here we are seven, eight years later, all of those things that they were presenting as fact, we have proven to be untrue. But no one believed me, us. Nobody believed us. I say me because I was the one on the phone. In, in 2010, and it was a really tough battle. And so it was managing as opposed to pitching, as opposed to trying to, you know, it was, the, the attention was gonna be there whether we wanted it to be or not. And I wanted it to be, because one thing I, I learned, and this is just my opinion, this is my theory on how to do this job, is there's gonna be a lot of negative stuff out there uh, in the noise. And you can say, ah, forget those guys. I mean, they, you know, they're just trying to get me. I'm not going to. Always drive your message. 
Always tell your story because no one else will. And even in these negative uh, pieces, we always drove a consistent message. And Nathan Dill is gold on camera under pressure. I mean, the guy is a machine. He's believable. He looks like your granddad. He looks like uh, somebody who can speak to you on a complex topic in a way that's easy to understand. He can explain the unexplainable in a way that's digestible, which is a skill I've rarely found in people I've worked for. And uh, we were on TV all the time explaining what went down, our perspective on what he did, why it wasn't the way it's being portrayed. And at the end of the day, it worked because when he looked into the camera, people believed him. So you come on board the deal campaign, March 2010, so yes. right around qualifying. Um, yes, I did. I, my first, my first, I believe it was in March is qualifying. Maybe, I think it was maybe April. April. Yeah. It was April. And I came down, did a meeting in the, it, our office was in the Gainesville airport in a hangar that had been built out. It was really, it was really pretty fancy. It didn't sound fancy, but it was like, you know, all this you know, nice glossy wood and it was really nice. And so we had a meeting in the hangar, uh, my first day in Georgia. And uh, we agreed that uh, the next day when this Office of Congressional Ethics thing came out, it was an existential threat for sure. the campaign. I mean, it really did look like something that ends your your chances. And uh, I think there was uh, an initial reaction to put your head in the sand because Congressman Deal is someone who's never lost an election, never lost an election in 40 years, 40 plus years of elected office. And... But not, it's not a media uh, uh, FaceTime hog. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't desire to be in the media and has kept a low profile through most of his career. He's pretty, even a pretty low profile governor as far as you know, being on the airways. It's just not his thing. He's always turned down national media. He, just, he doesn't care. But I said, if y'all don't go on TV and explain in a way that makes sense What's wrong about this report? How we're being targeted by uh, outside forces that are trying to make a name for themselves. And here's what really happened. Here's what I was thinking. I'm just going to just go back to my house in Washington because this is, this is over. And Nathan Dill held a news conference in Gainesville and explained it. And that day, because he did a great job with that, he began to turn the ship a little bit. And then... We did a news conference at the Capitol, I think a week or two later, for qualifying. And um, from that point on, really did nothing but grow. Uh, despite, you know, Trump talks about fake news. You know, we were taking incoming just like he was with a brutal storyline. And we didn't have, unlike him this alternative communication source. We had Twitter and Facebook, but we didn't have 10 million people on it. <laughs> you know, we weren't driving the news cycle with our social media. We didn't have, we could not have done that. We still had to use traditional media in 2010. And, you know, and we used it effectively because they, Nathan Dill was willing to sort of put aside where his gut is, which is to just, you know, not be in front of the camera all the time. And, used his skill set to go out there and explain the, the inexplicable, and he did it brilliantly. 2010, a, a relatively large primary field full of you know, arguably much bigger names than Nathan Deal, despite being a congressman since 1992, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Been in the state senate, state legislature before that. Yes. How is he able to force a runoff um, given the negative storyline and the relatively low profile that you've described? Several factors played sure. in, into our favor. The front runner with an artificial lead throughout most of it was the then insurance commissioner, John Ironstein. And what we knew was that in the primary, while the media was gunning for us, they really hated John Oxentine and thought he was a crook, thought he was unethical. 
and everybody had a John Oxendine story that was just like eye rolling or appalling. But he had this artificial leave because he had he had name ID. He had been in state office for many many years. He was going around with a very hard right message, which in 2010 this was post stimulus, post Obamacare, depth of the recession, banking, the, the and Tea Party, the rise of the Tea Party. Our you know Georgia's economy is built on real estate and banking, which are the two things that were decimated. These were really bad times in Georgia, and Republicans were seething with anger. I mean, you, I sat down with our pollster that first night in the hangar for that meeting. The pollster said, you cannot be too conservative in this primary. You, there's nothing you can do that's going to be, that's too extreme because they're so angry and they so want somebody to fight Obamacare and to fight basically the Obama administration at, at every turn uh, that you just had to be hard right. And that's what Oxendine was doing. You know, he was going around promising he was going to eliminate income taxes, which, um, which is really hard to do when you look at the details. Um, Eric Johnson was very mainstream, had been in the state uh, Senate for a long time, didn't, but, but he was from southeast Georgia, where there's a very small population base. Really hard to win from there, traditionally. But he was a prolific fundraiser, as was Oxendine. They both raised... A lot of money. And both of them were up on TV earlier than anyone else, really by a long shot. And um, But Eric was coming from so far back uh, that even though he had a money advantage, it wasn't enough of a money advantage to move him that far, you know. And Eric was a really strong candidate. I think he would have been a good governor, too. You know, I really uh, think, think highly of him. I think he and Nathan Deal see the world very similarly. And then you had Karen Handel, who had statewide name ID, had that advantage, had some grassroots network. She was really liked by the grassroots people, I noticed, wherever, wherever we went. I mean, like the people who go show up for county party meetings, they really liked her. I think they still do. Um, and that anger that was so desired at that time by the Tea Party and the Republican base, I think it's just sort of her natural... Uh, default position. She, she's got kind of a hard edge to to her when she's on on the stump. Um, she she loves to be on the attack, and it's it's not a criticism. That's just I, I, a, a lot of folks do it really well, and that's she likes to do that. So that fit well with the times. Nathan Dill's not an angry person. He he doesn't pull off angry well. It's not who he is, and uh, so it, it's it's ironic that we rose to the top. Uh, given that uh, we took we took very very conservative positions and presented them in a uh, way that people understood, but he wasn't carrying a pitchfork or, uh, or setting fires. It just wasn't. It's just not him. And he stayed true to who he was because people notice. People know when you don't. And uh, our advantage were we raised enough money, though. We didn't have statewide name ID. We had serious approval ratings in the most Republican district in the state. So more Republicans lived in his area and the areas he had represented than anywhere else. So the most important places for a Republican to run up the numbers were where he did very well. And this was at the time the fourth most Republican district in the country. His his ninth congressional district still has been split since, but it's mm-hmm. still very very red, and that was a massive ad- advantage, and that was what kept him in that top tier in the polling. It was all North Georgia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we really got decimated. Augusta, Macon, all those other areas didn't do well at all. But in North Georgia, which is where it's much more important, we ran up the numbers, and Karen Handel uh, stopped. And so what happened was Oxendine was at the top, and just as we had predicted, the media onslaught began. It was all of these stories of him abusing his office, behaving unethically. Uh, he had commercials that were ineffective because he has kind of a funny sounding voice, and he was talking on camera, and it really sort of backfired. It hurt him. And 
he collapsed. I mean, went from first to to fourth, and uh, it was a gamble for us to predict that that would happen. But that's exactly what happened. Eric went from zero to uh, twenty, and I mean, a remarkable climb. And he deserves, and his team deserved tremendous credit for that. We didn't climb nearly that much. I mean, we held. Do you think he would have gone even higher if he were not from the Chatham, Bryan County? Yeah, area? and if he had, had a few more weeks, you know, or and enough money to fill it, mm -hmm. um, I think momentum was on his side. The other reason, and he may have overtaken us, were it not for the fact that there was a little known state senator named Jeff Chapman who represented an area south of Eric Johnson's district. So there were four coastal counties mm -hmm. that would have been Johnson counties that went to Jeff Chapman. And I don't know how the numbers break down, but if all those Chapman votes had gone to Eric, mm -hmm. it may have been enough to, to, to squeeze us out. So at the end of the day, we ended up beating him by two points. We're 10 points, maybe 14 points behind Karen Handel. She was at 34, 33, somewhere there. We were at 22. So I know from Dr. Bullock's class, I was a good student of his at the <laughs> University of Georgia. I remember I remembered that in class he said once, you know, 15 years before this, this moment, that the person who finishes first in the runoff wins 70% of the time. So, you know, we knew in that three-week sprint for the runoff that we had a 30% chance of right. winning. This, this crazy woman from Alaska named Sarah Palin was red hot at the time with Republican voters. She had come in for Secretary Chambliss in 08 here and had really had a, made a good impact, got great media coverage, and he ended up going on to win a you know, big runoff win in 08 against uh, a Democrat. And she had endorsed Karen Handel. And interesting story, uh, back then nobody had iPhones, we had Blackberries. And there was this little sheet metal restaurant meet and three in Gainesville, and there was we had a Honda Ridgeline truck for a campaign vehicle, and me and Nathan Deal we were in the Ridgeline driving over to get to get lunch. Uh, it's all a bunch of old Gainesville guys who were like his age, and he's just sitting there eating cornbread and chicken. And, and I get an email while we are um, sitting there at lunch, just during the runoff, that said Sarah Palin has endorsed. Um, Karen Handel, and she's, she's coming to Georgia. And um, I didn't want to ruin his lunch, so I didn't tell him. <laughs> and we got in the truck, and I said, um, Congressman Sarah Palin's endorsed Karen Handel. And he said, well, I guess that's it then. And it, she was that big. We thought that was going to be really impossible to, to overcome. And, and, and I apologize, I got the timing wrong. That may have been, I don't know if that was during the runoff or before, I think she endorsed uh, Handel, and then in the runoff, we found out she was coming to Georgia to do an event. And um, so, you know, what we did was um, in those three weeks was we raised money much more effectively than she did. We ran a devastating ad campaign that uh, is credit to Sonny Scott, our our media guy, that painted Karen as uh, not one of us on social conservative values. Uh, she had been a Fulton County commissioner where there's, you gotta be a little more moderate than you do in a rural area of Georgia. And so we were willing to cede those areas to her and take the, the rural uh, more conservative vote. And it was very effective. Um, and uh, she thought she had it in the bag. And I think that they rested on their laurels a little bit, whereas we were hungry. We went out there and got Mike Huckabee, who, you know, had a Fox TV show, so he has he has some cachet too. And so the weekend before the election, for the runoff, which was August the 10th, 2010, and uh, on Sunday at the Gainesville Civic Center, Mike Huckabee came in and uh, did an event for us, and the place was packed out. I mean, the visual was stunning. I mean, it was a raucous crowd. The room was full, and it was an amazing event. We owned the news on Sunday. 
uh, during the five and elevens, and and um, just got great coverage from it. I mean, the visuals they were just so fantastic. And the next day, Sarah Palin came in to Buckhead and did an event for Karen Handel, and it got gangbuster coverage too. Great crowd, great visual. You know, Sarah Palin knows how to do a soundbite. Um, but here's the thing. The coverage that day did, Karen Handel came to, today to, I'm sorry, the coverage was Sarah Palin came to town today to campaign for Republican Karen Handel, who's on the ballot on Tuesday. Yesterday, Governor Mike Huckabee of Arkansas came for Nathan Deal, and then they showed vision. So it was a split. Now, we own Sunday. We had a split on Monday's coverage going into into the election. Now, whether that mattered or not, I don't know. But as a comms guy, that's how I think. And so it meant something to me that uh, that, that we had. That was a major coup. I don't think Nathan Deal wins without that Huckabee event. It, it gave us something to fill that space, and we needed that. He, and he, Huckabee was awesome. And the other uh, weird thing sort of played in our favor, and, and it takes a, a thousand little things to win when you win by 3,000 votes. Hold on one second, Brian. So going into that, we had several advantages uh, in addition to having a really rock star Mike Huckabee event that put us on even par with, with Palin to some degree. And some things that kind of went in our favor, the state legislators uh, as a whole just did not like Karen Handel. And they may not have known Nathan Deal, some did, but many were just with him because they were anti karen And they all did robocalls for us. I mean, so like every district that was represented by a Republican in the state basically heard from their representative. Almost, I mean, one or two Republicans in the state house had endorsed Karen. I mean, it was a tiny, teeny tiny number. And everybody was with us. And uh, the other thing that we had no control over was another runoff in the state was the Rob Woodall, Jody Heiss, both of whom are now in Congress from different districts, uh, running for the seventh district. And Woodall won that and kind of a bit of a surprise. But Nathan Deal won Gwinnett County and did very well in Barrow and other parts of that district, the seventh district then, because um, everybody who showed up to vote for Jody Heiss voted for Nathan Deal. And so Jody Hines ended up, in my opinion, that's, I have no data to back that up, but I just feel sure that anybody who voted for him was not going to show up and vote for, for Karen Handel. And I think that was an advantage. And um, that and the, the advantage we had on the air, those things added up to put us over the top. To give you something that nobody knows, 10 days out from the runoff, Our pollster had us 15 points down. And it was just a gut punch. So we were working around the clock and there was just so much stress and and strategy going on. And I went back to the place I was staying in Gainesville. I, had a, uh, I was staying with somebody on the campaign. We had a house in Nathan Dill's backyard. And I said, you know, the campaign's over might want to go ahead and start putting out resumes. There's really no way that we can close a gap of 15 points in 10 days. And uh, fast fast forward to the week going into the weekend um, before the runoff, and there was a media poll out that had us down four to five points, somewhere around there. And I was on the phone with a reporter from Gainesville, the Gainesville Times, and she goes, you know, doesn't look good. We're really on the campaign. Y'all are behind. What do you, what do you, or yeah, I said, this is fantastic. Why is it fantastic? You're losing. No, we're, we're moving. If we move this far in 10 days, we're going to win. Uh, I know where we were and I know where we are now. And if we're moving this fast, we're going to, we're going to beat her. And the person on the phone just thought I was absolutely bonkers or just spinning sure, like crazy. Sure. But I knew. I mean, I was. I had, a, I had a huge smile on my face. I was standing in 
the that auditorium in in, um, in Perry where they have the the Sonny's fish fry. It was Sonny's last fish fry. I was in I get, I was out in the the, um, the foyer of the building taking these phone calls. A huge smile on my face because I knew that was the first time I really thought we may pull this off. You know, uh, we were moving that fast. So. You pull it off. The deal campaign pulls it off. Um, moves on to the general election. And ba- based on your, your your previous comments, you had to be pretty confident going into the general election, two thousand ten, as the Republican nominee. You know, what was it like to to transition from Republican primary mode to general election mode? It's awesome. Primary or lonely. You um, you're always more comfortable. when you're talking about philosophical and political divides. And in a hard right Republican primary, you're all running toward the same positions. And so it becomes personal attacks. That's how you differentiate. And those are brutal on the families. They're, the, they're brutal on families that are receiving them because their their dad or their mom or their, their wife are, are getting right. attacked. And they're brutal on the families because they don't want to attack these other people. Yeah, because it, it's very hard. I think people think these, these people are robots. But a lot of them, when they say, I want to go home and gather this because of my family, they're telling the truth. I've watched it. I've seen the toll that politics takes on the family. And no one wants to be too out there for you. You don't know who you can trust. You don't know who's on your team. And that's that's... Isolating, and that's why you know, these teams that are together for a long time in the primaries. Well, they they're they're tight, they're thick as thieves, man, because they've they've been in foxholes when uh, nobody had their back, and you know I was at Nathan Dill's foxhole when nobody had his back, and there's a bond between me and him and Chris Riley and 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 everyone else who was on that team at the time because we were alone and we did it ourselves. In the general, it's much better. We're able to run against Obama, who was terribly unpopular in the state at the time and running against a, a former governor who had, who had built in extremely high negatives. It was going to be very hard for any Democrat to win in that atmosphere that year. So on August the 10th, yeah, at around 10, 10, 15, we're at the, the, the back at the Gainesville Civic Center where we had had the, the Huckabee event. We're up by about 10,000 votes at around this time in, in, the, in the vote count. And we're kind of getting close to the 10 p.m. news. You know, some of them had 10 p.m. news. Uh, Fox 5 had 10 p.m. And I said, why don't we, me and Nathan Deal, go upstairs out of the war room and go do a round with the media. Shake some hands, let them get some B-roll for the 10 and 11 o'clock news and and do some interviews that can be that can be ready to roll. And we thought we were kind of doing interviews, saying, hey, we remain hopeful, we're glad we're ahead, we feel good, but you know, we're still watching. And while we're up there, um, James Salzer was the guy from the AJC that night. Jeff Hollinger was there from Channel 2, Richard Belcher, I'm sorry, Hollinger from 11, Richard Belcher from Channel 2, Deidre Dukes from, from Channel 5. And uh, Salzer said to us, to me and Congressman Deal, are y'all going to declare victory? And we were like, are you kidding me? And AP hasn't called it. And I mean, we don't, we're, not, we're not setting ourselves up the biggest embarrassment ever because the votes that were out were Fulton votes. Karen's home. And... So there were possibly huge cachets waiting to, to come pouring in. That was our fear. I've never been really good at breaking down, you know, where the ballot boxes are. I don't, I don't know. I don't do math. That's why I do communications. <laughs> but the, uh, we knew we had a cushion. And Salzer said, we don't think there are enough votes out there. We've looked, but you know, the newsroom saying there's not enough votes left out there for her to make up the difference, even if she got all the votes. And it was at that moment 
that I finally believed this guy was going to be the nominee for governor of Georgia. And um, the picture directly behind you is taken was taken at that time, and it was really minutes after we found out Nathan Dill was going to be the nominee, and I knew that meant he was going to be governor. And so that moment on that on this picture on that wall was the most important moment of my life because it changed it forever more more than my my marriage and anything because I, I wouldn't have had my marriage and the kid I had without I without like, that moment. We're recording this, right? <laughs> yes. All of that came, um, you know, I met my wife because Nathan Dill won. Um, everything happened because of what was going down at that moment. Really, most important moment of my, happiest moment of my life probably, other than the birth of my daughter where I was just so tired that I didn't, it was, <laughs> I was just so tired. But at that moment, I was just walking on air. How does that compare to re-elect in 2014? Equally as confident going into? No. I was, I'm never confident, man. I, I'm always, um, I'm always pessimistic, and uh, Governor Deal's approval ratings in the state were always good, generally always over fifty percent. I mean, it'd be hard to find a time I think where he was below fifty percent. I mean, it was always, but it was never seventy percent, which is what you know Governor Bentley in Alabama had at the time, even though that went to hell. Um, <laughs> but Chris Christie had those before that went to hell. Maybe the moral of the story is never have 70% approval rating because <laughs> you're going to end up with zero. Governor Dill was always very consistent, but it wasn't overwhelming. And what we knew in polling was that if you break down that approval rating, the somewhat favorable was always much stronger than the strongly favorable. And so we, we knew we had some, some battles there. Uh, and so part of our strategy was, uh, one, maximizing the Republican vote, as always, but we believed that with his record, if we communicated it effectively, we could crack into the African-American vote because his criminal justice reform initiatives had decreased the number of African-American men going into our state prison system by 20%. I mean, a, a remarkable historical turnaround that made a huge impact in the African-American community and in, in, in individual families and individual lives. And he was in churches. He was communicating to them on urban radio. We really made a, a genuine effort. Uh, and we always had really strong numbers with Republicans. Um, we had passed immigration reform. It was really tough. We passed tax reform. Unemployment had continued to, to go down through the years. We had maintained the AAA bond rating through the recession, never raised taxes. We had done gun rights expansions. We had done abortion restrictions. And we had just checked every box in that, in that first term for, for Republicans. But then had the side things that could crack into to the Democrats. And one thing about Nathan Deal is he didn't, he's not someone who makes enemies. And so we didn't have any big groups that are just like out to murder us, which is always, always good. But the Democrats had a young face. It was a new approach, a famous name that had built-in ID with it, a built-in fundraising network that was significant. The money really did pour in. President Carter did step up to the plate and ignite his network to help Jason. And we have to be aware that Georgia is changing rapidly, that with each cycle, and we were two cycles past our 2010 win, Georgia gets a little more competitive. And so I was always leery that a six-point margin, it was a 10-point margin in, in 2010. I knew it was not going to be 10 points again. We knew we were going to lose ground. It was a matter of how much, and could we stay above 50? Nobody wanted to go to a runoff. I was getting married 10 days after the election, <laughs> so I did not need a runoff. And half of my wedding party was from Team Purdue, so they didn't want to run off either. Um, and I got married at the governor's mansion, by the way. So we, this is how, you asked me about how certain I was. I wanted to get married at the governor's mansion. There's this beautiful terrace there. Uh, that was there even before the governor's mansion was there. And we got married at the bottom of the terraces by the water fountain 
mountains, and the, the chairs were up the tail, trail. It's like a like an amphitheater, and we couldn't get married there during the election because my life was in a blender and the governor's life was in a blender. He didn't want some event at his house during all that. But I didn't want to like wait till the spring of 2015 because what if he didn't win? I was going to say, Jason Carter was probably not going to let Brian Robinson uh, come to uh, have a wedding at the governor's mansion. So we did it the week after the election, timing-wise, so we knew he would still be governor, no matter what. And I could do it where I wanted to do it, where Queen, Queen and my wife was the scheduler for Governor Purdue. So this was something that meant a lot to both of us. And um, it had been like a beautiful fall, 70, 80 degree weather even. And then we got married and the famous uh, polar vortex of 2014 came in. And so we got married in 45 degree weather outside at the governor's mansion. But the timing was because we couldn't be sure. It was not a done deal and no one saw it as a done deal. And that's an example of, of that. Where we were confident was we didn't think we were going to go to a runoff, you know. Um, otherwise, the timing would have been atrociously bad. No one would have come to my wedding. Well, you, you mentioned um, David Perdue's campaign. How cognizant of Michelle Nunn's campaign and its possible effect with, with a Carter and a Nunn yeah. in a general election? You know, were there any calculations there or, or um, you know, concerns that the Democrats could actually pull in enough rural, small-town white voters just by virtue of those names. Yes, I was concerned about that. We didn't talk about Michelle. No, we, we, we ran our own race, and David Perdue ran his, his race. And I'll get to that in a minute, sure, because that's, there's an interesting side story there. But here's how I tried to frame that as the communicator. You know, early that year... I gave a quote to the AJC that the Democrats have fielded the Downton Abbey Democrats. They think they should inherit their titles. We believe you should earn them. And so that Downton Abbey Democrats was kind of how I wanted to frame them, that these people wanted hereditary titles. And, but that was about all we ever talked about Michelle Nunn. I really was, in, in your campaign on a statewide level, you're so focused and so maxing out your bandwidth that you don't even for political animals you simply cannot follow other races because they're just not there's not the time for it so i wasn't i was only vaguely aware of what was happening in their race um but we did not whereas in 2010 isaacson was on the ballot and deal was on the ballot we coordinated we worked together it was we had there were deal isaacson signs mm -hmm. you know that the state party did Purdue would never have allowed that in, in 2014. You know, he was running as an outsider. And so they never really communicated this to us. And we did do conference calls together every week. But there was a tension there, even though we're all friends and remain friends to this day. Because uh, they didn't want to come out and say the truth. We think we have a better chance of winning than y'all do. We think y'all are going to bring us down. And... We don't want to be seen as holding events with somebody who is the establishment here. Well, we're running this anti-establishment, businessman, no political experience campaign. So they ran their own separate bus tour. You know, every other Republican did, did a bus tour together. Produced was separate. Every other Republican had an election night party together. Purdue had a separate election night party. So they kind of ran a parallel operation. It was not a team effort. And I'm not, it's not a criticism, it just wasn't a team effort. You've mentioned some of the key uh, Republican issues during Governor Deal's term, criminal justice reform, education reform. Um, are those issues that will perhaps outlast or transcend a, a, a Deal administration? Um, are those going to be centerpieces for uh, a future Republican administration? Are those centerpieces of a Republican policy in Georgia? Um, the criminal justice reform and education reform? Yeah, or any others that you can, you can think of. I think 
the criminal justice reforms made me very nervous in 2011. Um, we never talked about that on the campaign trail. It never, it never was discussed. And I'm sitting with Nathan Dill in the transition office in late 2010 and beginning to get some speeches ready. We have some major addresses coming up. And we've got you have the, uh, the inaugural, A, which he largely wanted to write himself. Uh, he, he writes them out handwritten. It's probably in an archive somewhere now. We had the Eggs and Issues Breakfast, which is it was going to be his debut on that stage. And then later that day, I think, we did the State of the State Address. That's a lot of different things to make news at and to have new pronouncements at. And I sat down with him to kind of put take down some notes on what I, what he wanted to say. And he's, he listed out some priorities and then said the crime issue. Although he said the crime issue. I'm sorry, he said the issue. <laughs> And I was like, the crime issue? <laughs> what what crime issue? And, you know, his son is a drug court judge, and uh, those experiences had really set in with Nathan Deal, and he knew all along that he wanted to do this and kind of came out right out of the gate. And I had no idea how this would pull. I had no idea how... Republicans or Georgians at large would feel about it. It seemed to me that we were setting ourselves up for our own Willie Horton moment, that if somebody got a slap on the wrist when they should have been thrown in jail and then went out and committed some horrific, violent crime, that it would be devastating for our re-elections. I was really nervous about it. Went on to win approval by overwhelming majorities, maybe unanimous. And if it wasn't unanimous, it was one or two no votes, and we continue to see that sort of support throughout the the first term and really into the, to the second term of unanimous support for what we were doing. I was and remain blown away at the fact that this issue came out of nowhere. Nathan Deal was able to message it effectively. Someone could have demagogued this issue very easily and made him soft on crime. No one ever did. No one ever did, and it worked beautifully. And this was 2011. We were still cutting the budget significantly. All our prisons were packed out, and he comes in, and the Department of Corrections commissioner is like, we've got to build a new prison. It's going to be $265 million. And Nathan Deal said, I've got a better idea. We're going to quit putting so many people who are not dangerous to society into prison. And we never did build that new prison. The jail backlog that was affecting jails and sheriff's departments across the country was miles long. It's gone. And we're getting, we're, we're spending less money and we're getting better results. And each step of the way, each year, we've added a little more, you know, going more toward reentry, making sure that they can get jobs making sure they get their GEDs or their high school diplomas when they're in there. And for those who have high school diplomas, helping them get some sort of technical college degree. Because look, it's not being soft on crime. It's preventing future crime. And that was how he saw it. And if you want to make Nathan Dill cry, and he's, you know, he's, a, he's, um, he's an emotional man. He, he tears up at, at a lot of these, uh, these stories where his policies have improved lives. Medical marijuana and these, these kids. I mean, he just... He just uh, wells up. But his real soft spot um, are the people who messed up, uh, perhaps are mentally ill, perhaps have a drug addiction, who got caught, got help, got better, and then went back to jobs and raising their families. I was in this jewelry store in Gainesville and they gave him a watch fixed and um, the guy at the cash register got my credit card and he goes, Brian Robinson, are you the guy who's Nathan Dill's spokesman? And I was like, yes, I am. And he said, um, did you see that girl over there? That's my daughter. And uh, Jason Dill saved her life. The governor's son, he's a drug court judge. I was like, really? I said, yeah, yeah. She was all strung out. Um, she lost her, she 
the courts took her, her kid away from her. And um, if she didn't get help, if she hadn't fought, she was going to, she was going to die. She was in, in terrible, terrible shape. And, and today, she's here working. She has her kid back. She has her life back. I told Nathan Dill that story when I got back to the office. Tears rolling down his face. Tears rolling down my face. It was very emotional. You, you, you know, it was just, you saw the impact on these families. And Nathan Dill has done that a thousand times over now in the state of Georgia. There are families who have been kept together. There are people who have kept their jobs, who haven't lost everything, who don't have a felony record that prevents them from getting employment because Nathan Deal had a vision and he had leadership ability and he had communications ability to tell Georgians why this wasn't dangerous, why this wasn't crazy, why we should give it a try. He was right. He was right across the board. Governor Deal is effective at, at, at selling that policy, which, as you admitted, may have had a downside politically. I was scared of that. It didn't. Um, the, school char- uh, the charter school education reform. Yeah. Why was the 2016 um, education reform amendment not as successful, or was not successful? What happened? And obviously, you were out of the the administration by that time. I was, but, yes. But what what's your insight as a as a communications messaging person? Why that perhaps that that amendment failed? Well, on that, I want to admit that while I was gone by the time it got onto the ballot, I was one of the team members in the twenty fourteen election season, and then the twenty fifteen session of the General Assembly that pushed very hard for the governor to get behind this. And that's not, I'm not, you know, un- undermining him. That's, that's how this works. The team, there's a team of staff and they all have ideas and we disagree vehemently sometimes. The governor's torn sometimes, has to come down on one side or the other. And this wasn't a universally agreed upon idea within the administration. There were, there was pushback, there was knowledge from the governor himself that teachers were going to be steadfastly against it and we were going to embolden and engage the education bureaucracy establishment to come out against us. And so there was consternation about about that. It was a fight to get it on the ballot. The, we had to really twist arms and make deals to get to the two-thirds majority in, in both houses. Uh, it's, and it should always be hard for the most part to get that, to get that, that much. Uh, but in the spring and summer of 2016, there was no one talking about this. There was a vacuum. And uh, I think if we had had a stronger operation to explain it and what he hoped to accomplish, we could have filled that vacuum. Uh, Instead, what happened was these teacher unions and the no groups organized, raised a significant amount of money, and they filled the vacuum first. And they had enough money to really fill it. And they messaged it well, and... I still, it wasn't until like the last month that I really thought that we would lose because it was worded to be something like you'd be like, yes, that sounds good. I want to help, I want to help failing schools. That was how it was worded on the ballot. Most voters are passive voters. So I thought that even if uh, there were these anti-messaging campaigns going on, there were going to be a lot of passive voters who just came in, saw the, the ballot language and said yes. Uh, I was spectacularly wrong. But on, on criminal justice and on, on education reform, I will say, these will continue to be major Republican issues in Georgia. We've gotten over the political hump, mm-hmm. you know, with criminal justice reform. I don't know how many more reforms we can really do. I mean, we're kind of getting to like very small, minute policy issues now. But I think we're not going to go backwards. And that's going to be the important thing. I think we're going to hold... One, because it's fiscally conservative, not just uh, 
socially uh, liberal. So a couple issues that, that were very contentious. Um, religious liberty yeah. and campus carry. Yeah. That, that, you know, that expansion, that particular expansion of gun rights. Um, where was the governor's thinking at, you know, his policy position, and how, how did it work within the various Republican constituencies? Because it, far from settled issues, even within um, the governing party here in Georgia. Yeah, it's the kind of decision that you can make in a second term when you aren't running for re-election or for another office. You know, he was in his 70s by then. By the time he gets out of office, he'll be 76. And so this is it. This is the last train to Clarksville here. And that gives you a certain liberty and flexibility to act out of conscience and act out of the greater good sometimes and I think the both issues weren't just tough politically they were tough for him personally he is someone who voted for religious freedom in Congress mm -hmm. the one that everyone talks about that President Clinton signed he is someone who believes very firmly in it and doesn't necessarily see it as uh, a bad thing in and of itself. And I think in a vacuum would fall on the side of religious liberty on, on, most, on most things. And on campus carry, here's someone who signed the Guns Everywhere bill, quote unquote, in 2014, heading into our reelect. Someone who had a A-plus rating from the uh, NRA, who was endorsed by the NRA in 2010 and got Tremendous support from them. They they cut ads for us, did out did postcards, etc. He's always been a gun rights person, and again, in a vacuum, falls toward gun rights. And in this particular case, he had to, to deal with with the nuance uh, in a world that eschews nuance, and. He he struggled. I, I mean, I, I watched the RIFRA veto message on live stream. And after having been with him all those years, I had no idea what he was going to say. Because I knew he could go either way. Um, I knew he struggled with it. And it could have gone, it could both could have gone either way. And with, with the RIFRA veto, I hope history preserves those words. Like with that first inaugural, it was written by him in his hand. I mean, these are, these are, those notes are out there. It was the most beautifully written veto statement, perhaps, in the history of mankind. I mean, it was so moving, it was so well thought out, so convincing, so rational, so understanding of both sides' perspectives. It didn't make anybody evil, anybody a bigot. There are two legitimate points of view here. I did this today because I believe our religious freedoms are protected already. There are no examples. No one can tell me an example of where a person of faith has been uh, violated, where their rights have been trampled on. No one can give me an example in Georgia. Don't talk to me about Colorado and Oregon. They have different laws than we do. You know, no one knows this. But Georgia's only uh, one of a handful of states that have no civil rights protections for anybody, not just African Americans or uh, religious minorities, but for anybody. And so you're perfectly free to discriminate here if you want to. Religious freedom statute or not, you can do that. We're not those states where the, the wedding cake and photographer and florist issues came up. It won't apply here. He knew that rationally. And so he was able to confidently say religious freedom is preserved here. We're not going to just put a spotlight on our state and tell international and domestic companies looking to relocate headquarters or to, or to build new factories or, or, uh, or other new job creating investments. Hey, 
We want to dive into really divisive social policy that's going to have no practical impact on the daily lives of Georgians and drive away jobs. We saw North Carolina had a devastating impact from the public perception that they were passing a law to discriminate. At the same time, Georgia benefited from Nathan Dill's veto. We had a string of eye-popping job announcements all summer long. And a lot of those had been put on hold because these recruiters and site selectors were holding their breath, waiting to see what Georgia would do. They were not going to come to Georgia if he signed it. It's not theory. That was real. There were some boards, some bulletin boards, where Georgia got taken off of the prospect list because we were considering it. The timeline was such, they didn't want to bother with it. We're just not going to mess with it. We're going to go somewhere else. But when Nathan Dill did that, and he did it in such a beautiful way, the world reacted. And we, we just had a tremendous 2016 because of him. So sort of zooming back a bit, the Republican Party of Georgia wins the governor's mansion in 2002, first time since... 1868. Governor Bullock. Rufus. Rufus Bullock. Um, so 2003, Governor Sonny Perdue takes, takes over. 2004, 2005, state, state Senate, State House. So the Republicans are going now 15 or so years uh, in power. Yeah. What's the biggest threat to the Republican Party's governing coalition here in Georgia? Is there, or is this a permanent Republican majority? Ha, to quote, great Colorado. question. The days in the South or anywhere else in this country where you have one party that dominates for 150 years are, are long since gone. We are much closer to parity in Georgia today than people think. Uh, in Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee are not close to parity. They're still, those, those states are much closer to what looks like a permanent majority for Republicans. It will certainly last much further into the future. We don't know what the Trump effect is going to be long term. It may help Republicans in Alabama and Tennessee and hurt Republicans in North Carolina, Georgia, and in Texas possibly. We don't, we don't quite know yet, but we do know that Georgia is one of uh, three or four red states where Trump is currently underwater, and that's probably indicative of the tectonic plates shifting here somewhat. The 6th District race should not have been a race between a Republican and, and Democrat. It should have been a race between two Republicans getting into the runoff. And it wasn't. And everyone was kind of holding their breath on both sides to get to the, to the finish line, not knowing what would happen. And we ended up getting kind of a traditional outcome with a six-point win for for the Republican there, but the fact that Democrats were willing to spend $30 million here, which is more than we've ever spent on a statewide race in Georgia, shows you that they think that this is fertile ground. Uh, we should believe them and take it seriously. We've got to be super careful about Gwinnett, Henry, Cobb counties, particularly right now. Uh, we've already uh, lost tremendous ground and like Douglas and Rockdale, which used to be Republican bastions. Uh, they're now majority minority and uh, run by Democrats. Uh, Gwinnett, Republicans will have a hard time holding on into the future. This used to be one of those Republican places in the country. Uh, Southwest Cobb, completely Democrat now. So we're seeing some huge shifts and getting closer to parity every, every year. So the trick for Georgia Republicans is maintaining the majority they have, keeping their current voters in the pen while changing tone, focus, perspective on some things to widen the tent. And I think you can argue that uh, we're going to get that a win for us is getting 10 to 15 percent of the African-American vote for now. Most, you know, Nathan Deal got double digits, but David Perdue got single digits with African-Americans. But 
we got it only because we targeted it and worked it so very, very hard. Where we've got to be aware, though, is Georgia today is not Georgia of 1980. It's not. This many white people, this many black people. It's much more diverse than that. Our African-American population is growing because this is the best place to live if you're an African-American. Like, this is the place to come. We have one of the richest African-American, one of the most successful African-American communities in the country. But if you're going to Gwinnett County, particularly, or, or you go along Buford Highway mm-hmm. in DeKalb County, it's every ethnicity in the world. It's a South Asian community that is a pretty affluent community. A lot of them who come here are engineers, lawyers, doctors, etc. And uh, your East Asian community, you have a huge Korean population, uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, and those communities aren't traditional white Republican voters, obviously. They're an opening. We've got to start getting them. Many of them, many of our Latino voters are church going, uh, uh, have nuclear families, uh, are, are business owners. If you took those things, and said it about a white person, you would you would assume that they are Republican. So there's an opening there with some of the Latino community, but we're not going to get there with them until we start to get past some of this immigration stuff. Now, I didn't say Republicans are wrong on that. I mean, the Republican base wants there to be the rule of law and wants those borders to be enforced. They agree with Donald Trump, as do I, that a nation without borders is no longer a nation. And... That's a delicate balance, and I'm not going to condemn the Republicans for taking a hard line on it and suffering politically in the long run um, because they're they're right. And so they have to do that balance. They have to do that balance of what is politically expedient to expand the tent versus doing what their base is most passionate about, what their principles demand, and what's, in their view, best for the state and the country. So there are some openings there, but... Georgia Republicans cannot set the tone or the pathway by themselves. I don't know what it is. It's it's that buzz. We we can't figure out. It's but it's it's permanent. It's a permanent buzz. Um, Georgia Republicans cannot by themselves determine the future and the pathway. There are going to be national uh, trend lines that we can't avoid, and what Trump does is going to play a major role for us. What George W. Bush did played a major role. What Obama did played a major role for us. They're the things beyond our control. But you know, they say all politics is, is local. Tip O'Neill said that. I think that's much less true than when Tip O'Neill said it. We're at, a, at, a, at least at a moment where politics is very nationalized and tribalized. And so... It's hard to make inroads into someone else's tribe if they identify as as tribal. Really, the only way to do it once you're in that setup is through increasing birth rates. And guess what? The least fertile people in the world are white people who are almost all Republicans. And so... We, we face a real issue there. You know, white people all over the world are going down in, in, in population. And that means something in politics. Now, as white people in Georgia, every year, a significantly less part of the, of the population. When Sonny Perdue won in 2002, the white percentage of the vote was in the mid to high 70s. When Saxby Chambliss ran in the runoff in 2008, it was in the low 60s. And that's just in a very short period of time and very meaningful to to elections in Georgia. You know, Purdue won his reelect with 58%. Johnny won in 2004 with 58% or thereabouts. You will not see those sort of margins in Georgia for some time in highly contested races where you have legitimate candidates on both sides. It's, you know, the Democrats have a very high floor now. 
It was 42, which is what Barnes got in 2010, what Mark Taylor got in 2006. I think the floor is probably a little bit higher. You know, uh, during the Obama years, the ceiling was 47, so they had a five-point swing in there. Um, but I think with each year, their ceiling gets a little bit higher. And by the 2020s, Democrats will be very competitive in statewide races in a way that they're not today and haven't been for the last 10 years. In the General Assembly, in our congressional delegation, we should continue to be able to maintain control through redistricting in 2022, 2021. And because we have super majorities to play with in the General Assembly, it's going to take a long time. You have some, even as districts change, incumbents are going to have an advantage. There are many reasons why Republicans can maintain control of the Gold Dome House and Senate into the 2030s. But I'm not going to take my jaw up off the floor if we have a Democratic governor before the 2030s. It's, it's very possible. Or, you know, while we can control, to some degree, manage our U.S. House delegation by packing Democrats and spreading out Republicans, we're not going to be able to do that, obviously, with the two U.S. Senate. And, um, you know, we don't know what David Perdue's long-term goals are, and we know that Johnny out of the Senate, at the very least, is, you know, in the uh, the latter stages of his career. So we've talked about how you know, this isn't 1980 anymore, and it's not 1970s, 1960s, where Democrats were successful by fusing an awkward coalition of voters. African Americans, probably the most liberal to progressive uh, constituency, with rural and small town whites who are historically and still are the most socially and culturally, if not economically, a um, bit more populous in, in terms of economics, to now the Democrats, Hillary Clinton, was able to get 20, 21% of the white vote. I, I, I believe Michelle Nunn, Jason Carter, 24, 25% of the white vote. Is that going to hold going forward? Or how, how, how do re Democrats... And we've talked about uh, demographic as destiny. How do Democrats win more of the white vote? Because a very, very small number you know, increase there boosts Democratic chances immeasurably, um, as opposed to cobbling together different identity groups, African Americans, Latinos, Asians. How, how do you think the Democrats are fight back? I think part of why Democrats have uh, perhaps been more passive on those strategies than they should have been was because they believed so strongly that the demographics are already changed so much that they were going to win. They just need to get keep the small percentage of the white vote. We had all of these people of color and people of different ethnicities that were going to come together for their coalition. and. It's held off. We've held that off up to this juncture. But look at the 6th District race. You don't get to 48% of the vote without a lot of white people in this district. And so John Ossoff proved that there is a pathway to do it. John Ossoff lost, but he got a lot of votes from people who voted for Tom Price, Johnny Isaacson, and Nathan Deal. There's no way... You get to where he did without getting votes of people who usually voted for Republicans. So that's some, somewhere where, I don't know if it's short-term or if it's long-term, but you know, Trump is going to help hold white Georgia in rural and exurban areas. But he could very well hurt and help Democrats increase their share of the white vote in the places where the population is growing, where you have higher levels of education, and in uh, which in, in Georgia is largely around Metro Atlanta, I mean, there are pockets of highly educated, wealthy people all over, all over, but most of them live in Atlanta, and so Atlanta is their target if they want to get white votes. They can they can write off rural Georgia, like you know Democrats can for white people. They're just they're nowhere near getting it and getting further away. But 
Republicans have that battle in suburbia. We have got to maintain, uh, particularly Republican women, Republican married women who have kids. If we lose them, oh my God! I mean, we're going, we're, we are, we are funneling down the toilet if we, if we lose them, and that's where we have to be really careful when we approach issues like campus carry. We want to maintain our base. We want to tell them that we're doing something that's important to them, that's advancing the cause. But you get to a point where your laws are already so pro-gun that to keep proving to your base that you're doing something, you keep moving the line. And we have now moved firmly into the line. This is not my opinion. This is data. We have now moved into an area where a majority of Republicans, but not a huge majority of Republicans support something like campus carry, but a majority of Georgians are against it. And it was very much the same with RIFA. Majority of Georgians supported it. Majority, a majority of Republicans supported it. Majority of Georgians did not. So we're getting into those issues to keep showing our base we're doing something. And we are inadvertently creating an opening for moderate Democrats to say, hey, uh, I'm against that. that, that that's going too far. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of conservative too. I'm not going to be crazy. This is John Ossoff model. I'm not going to scare you. I'm going to work. I'll work with anybody. I'm going to cut weights. You know, using these Republican sayings to put Republicans at ease. But I'm not a Trump. I'm not. I'm not like these Trump guys, and they're they're crazy. They're crazy. Ossoff saw that opening and walked through it, and that opening is going to continue to be there because Republicans have to continue to to let their voters know. Look, we're fighting for your values. We're we're advancing the cause, but. You, you do reach a point where you begin to lose on the back end. You know, there, there's, a, there's an umbrella that's moving. Is that going to be hard? You mentioned how the Republicans are going to be able to, to hold power under the gold dome, much, much in the same way the Democrats did in the 1990s, especially after Roy Barnes came in with, with, with redistricting in 2001. Is it going to be harder to keep that balance, to, to expand the, you know, get a bigger tent for the Republican Party if those districts are increasingly conservative or increasingly uh, stacked with conservative populations, what with moderates and liberals packed into, as you say, urban and sort of the, the older suburban, you know, here in Brookhaven, places like that. Um, is that going, policy-wise and politically, how, do, how is, is that going to be harder to balance going forward? as Republicans try to maintain their their majority? It's already a hard balance because when you have super majorities in the legislature and a Republican governor and a Republican lieutenant governor, you uh, can get the low-hanging fruit, the, that's the, the best public policy, the best fixes to the stuff the Democrats were doing that appeases uh, Republican-based voters, it, it's pretty easy. If you're taking over for Democrats, there's, there's lots of stuff to do, lots of stuff to fix. And about year 15, you've done all of those, those low-hanging things. And so you begin to see that there's a, a dearth of policy ideas because we've already done it. It's, it's not, so it, in an effort to do something, to not be do nothing, you you come up with things that perhaps move you further away from the mainstream. Whereas really and truly, the best policy for Georgia, which is well-governed, is to maintain the status quo and focus on things like workforce development, uh, increasing graduation rates, getting more people through uh, technical colleges and, and completing four-year degrees in four years, doing those things. Uh, building transportation networks, uh, that sort of thing. It's not sexy politics, but that's how you prepare for, for future growth and future success. It's what our forebears did that made us different than South Carolina and Alabama. We are far, far ahead of them. Now, granted, us being far ahead of them is kind of bad for our Republican politics. 
they have more stasis than we do. They have not had the dynamic growth and change. South Carolina more than Alabama, but not what, there's no Atlanta in South Carolina. And because of this economic magnet, take the film industry, which has boomed here because of the film tax credit. The people moving in here may be white, but they're not conservatives. We are bringing in people who have a different cultural background, different political principles into the state. And they're coming here because we're wildly successful at what we've set out to do, but it will have a long-term impact mm -hmm. on our politics. It will change. The Republican Party in Georgia will change with it. I'm convinced of that. They, they, we will see subtle, subtle changes. You're going to begin to see it. We have major super majorities, as I've said several times, in the General Assembly, but we're not after for long. You know, there are some seats where we were holding on that we're going to lose, uh, where Democrats with no money, no campaign, came within a hair's breadth of beating an incumbent who was well-funded and did run a campaign. We know in those districts, Democrats are going to pay attention. They're going to win some of those. Mm -hmm. Henry, Gwinnett, Cobb, look in those areas for, for those changes. So uh, we're going to begin to see some losses, maintain our majorities, keep winning statewide races for now, but we're going to lose just a few, and it's going to get those competitive juices flowing again. We've got to know we cannot sit back and do what we've always done, just appeal to one segment of the population. We've got to appeal to new segments of the population, unless we don't care about the future. And maybe and there's always some 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 group that doesn't. You know, they're older. They're not they're not going to be around that much longer. We're just you know I, I like it how it is. I'm going to fight to keep it how it is, and that is my goal for young Republicans. And I'm 42. I'm not young, but I hope to be in the state for 50 to 60 more years. <laughs> and maintaining that Republican majority is important to me and to my business. And I want to do what we have to do to be dynamic, to be nimble, and to respond to the changes in the state. And, you know, frankly, Nathan Dill, Casey Cagle, David Rawson, Johnny Isaacson uh, are particularly those. And, um, you know, we, we have you know, Sonny Perdue and, and Tom Bryce in the cabinet. You know, David Perdue being basically Trump's floor leader in the Senate, I, I do think that we are projecting a serious image of the state on the national level and on, on the international level that we're not kooky. We have more so than our neighbors put aside and put behind us the injustices of the past, that we are a welcoming state We've got a great educational system. We're not a backwater. We are a global destination. And our Republican leadership deserves credit. We're not doing the less dramatics, riding around the Capitol backwards on a bicycle, <laughs> you know, hokey tricks anymore. We're not what we used to be. We are a mature society here. And Republicans have, have been nimble. They have changed. We're not you know, compare our politics to Alabama and Mississippi. We're in Louisiana. We're much more, we're, we're, we're much advanced. And would you, would you credit that? I think Republicans and Democrats can probably agree on that, that the, the you know, driving force between, uh, as you said, you know, policy and stuff is, is you know, pro-growth. So economic development, infrastructure development, and obviously that, that does set, you know, there are tensions within within both parties about yeah. how to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something moving forward that Democrats and Republicans are, are going to be able to see eye to eye on? Is the economic development pro-growth, you know, using government as an engine uh, to, to help drive that growth? I think we have a lot of consensus on those issues in this state you can almost guarantee an applause line when you talk about new investments into the Port of Savannah. People know how important Hartsfield Jackson is, not just to Metro Atlanta, but to the entire state. And you saw Republicans who had campaigned on never raising taxes 
coming together, leading the effort to raise taxes on transportation so that we could build roads and update our infrastructure, which was sorely, sorely needed. So you saw a bipartisan consensus there. You see a bipartisan consensus on what we do on uh, technical school training, on getting high school students into into technical colleges while they're still in high school, so they're closer to a degree, uh, and uh, letting people come back without losing their credit so we can get more people with diplomas by having coordination between the technical system and the university system so that they classes transfer over. We're doing a lot of things. Uh, you're seeing some bipartisan consensus, even though this is a partisan divide on hope. Uh, Republicans have fought for a merit-based system that's kept our best and brightest here, and that, by the way, has increased in graduation rates. The Democrats largely want some needs-based, which makes sense. Rich people don't need it. Poor people do. If this is going to be something that lifts the poor into the middle class, you have to focus the resources on them. The downside is you go back to exporting your best and brightest to Duke and Vandy and, and Harvard and Princeton and Berkeley yeah, and even Austin and Chapel Hill in Charlottesville. We go back to that almost immediately if we do that. And the structure of hope becomes a failure because if we make it needs-based, most people who get it will uh, lose it by the end of the first year and many of them will drop out of college. And so we've invested all this money that's worthless. It goes, I mean, that with very, very few returns. There will be a few really special kids who get through, but the amount of people who lose hope and then don't graduate, where in and there's that money is completely squandered because there's in the in our economy someone with one year of college in a university system is no better off than someone with a high school diploma that money is just gone so it's a legitimate debate and that's going to be that's one of the divides but those are the issues you get to go find to find the divides you're going to have some cultural divides we're seeing it right now on confederate memorials democrats say we should bring mm -hmm. them down in speaking in generalities, Republicans say we should pr preserve them. And so those, those are the sort of divides that we have. But when it comes to uh, education, when it comes to transportation, there's general consensus here. So you brought up hope, technical schools, Confederate memorials, uh, all issues that have bubbled to the surface in, in the Democratic gubernatorial primary. Mm -hmm. You're a Republican work for Republicans, consult with Republicans. If you're, if you're willing to offer some, some prognostication on the other side, how do you see the Stacey Evans, Stacey Abrams race playing out? Assuming they are the only two, I can't imagine much oxygen left for any other challenger. Yeah. I think the state race. The state's probably run out of Stacey by that point in time. Um, <laughs> We have political science because there is some math involved mm. in this. And if you just look at it, you have a majority African-American electorate in the Democratic primary. You've got a uh, woman of color who is gifted, who is accomplished, who is articulate and uh, a defender of liberal perspectives. And... and and effective one at that. And on the other side, you've got a uh, another super bright, accomplished woman with a great narrative, raised in a trailer in tumultuous circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, built herself up, first in her family to go to college and then to law school. Now is a gazillionaire because she won some class action lawsuit and is given half a million dollars to UGA's law school. Yeah, but you look at it, and you think Stacey Abrams, the woman of color, is going to have a definite advantage and it's going to be really hard to overcome. What's fascinating is that amongst the elites in the Democrat Party in Georgia, is it is biracial on both sides. You see high-profile African-Americans, such as the DA in DeKalb County, endorsing the white candidate. And uh, some prominent white folks like Roy Barnes endorsing the white candidate. And you see white people and black people endorsing Stacey Abrams. So if you just look at the news coverage, you think there's much more of an even split amongst that. Just because you're black 
and I'm black doesn't mean I'm voting for you. Just because you're white and I'm white, I'm voting for you. Uh, maybe we're past that. Maybe this is just a huge breakthrough, but I think you have to put the chips on Stacey Abrams to have the, the advantage in this. And it's a huge mistake for her to make a huge play on, on identity politics, which is what it appears she is doing. It is the best thing that can happen for Republicans will be for her to go out there and do this cultural war left-wing campaign to win the primary, to fend off uh, Stacey Evans and make sure that she doesn't make too many inroads with African-American voters. But if she does that, which she is, Republicans would have a hard time losing this next November. So the Republicans in 2018, um, you know, a growing, growing uh, primary field, full of now veterans. Um, who are some of the future? Wh what's the future of the Republican Party? Who are those future prospects that that are going to be those people in the 2020s and 2030s that yeah. you've been talking about? Well, potentially, obviously, since we're looking into the future with you. Yeah. Well, you, you've got this one generation that's probably beginning to like age out. Your, your Sonny Perdue's, Tom Price's, Lynn Westmoreland's, Bill Gingrich's. Um, yeah, which is normal, the normal churn of this process. Uh, Nathan Dill certainly is at the end of his of his 45-year cycle. Keep a close eye on Chris Carr, and the Attorney General, who's a damn good dog. And uh, I think he would be someone to consider for a future governor's race in the 2020s, a future U.S. Senate race. Let's we'll see how, how good of a campaign he runs in 2018. And if it's a, a competent, well-run, well-executed campaign, you're talking about a really serious person. He's a very serious profile, great bio, uh, was with, you know, highly identified with Johnny Isaacson, who's one of the most popular people in, in the state, uh, but now also highly identified with Nathan Deal, for whom he worked as a commissioner and then was appointed by Nathan Deal. So he's a, he is aligned with two of the most well-known, well-liked Republicans, and he's in that mold. And if the Republicans continue to be nimble and change with the times and, and respond to the changes in Georgia, Chris is the person who can pull that off. Um, you know, you've got a few other young folks who were, who were in the General Assembly who could have potential futures, Brian Strickland from Henry County, You've got Hunter Hill, who's running for governor. Who knows if this is a launching pad or just a pause, but there's still a future for him. Uh, there's uh, Tom Graves, who went from being a bomb thrower, firebrand, to being, by all accounts, an important statesman and voice for Georgia in the House of Representatives, now uh, a, a powerful member of the Appropriations Committee. Doug Collins is the vice chair of the House Republican Conference. He's in line to be the House GOP Conference chairman, which is the head of messaging for them. So a chance to not only empower him and raise his profile, but if he has Jordan staff to really put them at the leadership table. And uh, you have a, a, rel a, a younger delegation now than you've had um, in recent years. David Perdue is is still young enough that he can run for governor at some time in the future if he so wishes. But it does look at this juncture like he's got his sights set on a, um, a national level. So, you know, those are some names. And, and here's the thing. Um, there, as I always say, when people are talking about who is going to run in, in 2018, uh, nobody was talking about Nathan Deal in 2007 and 2008 to run for governor. We don't know who's out there, who's going to emerge. And no one in January 2013 was talking about David Perdue. And they knew that last name, but had nothing to do with him. It wasn't because he was CEO of Reebok and everybody knows who that is. <laughs> it was because he had a cousin. And so we don't know who these people are who are going to come out of, of the woodwork. You know, it could be uh, someone who's a Vunderkin like Houston Gaines out of Athens, who could very well win a state house seat this year at age 22, 23, 
and you know, by his mid twenties, be be someone who has significant influence in the general assembly and is looking at higher office. It's uh, and I, another name I would mention, uh, who she's currently being profiled in the AJC, but there's a a twenty one year old who is now the executive director of the state Republican Party, Carmen Foskey, who is a UGA dropout. I mean, she's doing it remotely because she just, she being in Athens, she was just away from politics. And this is someone who's got an amazing record. I mean, she worked on Purdue Senate race, uh, ran the mayor's race in Savannah, Republican won for the first time in forever, did Doug Collins' reelect in the ninth district in the race against Paul Brown in the primary. Uh, went out to Missouri with all the Purdue clan and ended up becoming political director of the Greitens campaign for governor, which went on to win. And uh, she had to like resign her political director's job to go back to school for the fall semester. Uh, so she's got an amazingly good record. Then went on to do John Watson's race for uh, state GOP chair and won that one as well. Highly contested. Certainly was no shoe in that they were going to win that. Right. And, uh, She's probably, not probably, she is the best young operative in the state. So we, we have some new people coming in who are tremendous talents. Carmen is, is incredible. I hope to have her in my foxhole uh, on many occasions in the future. She's, she's awesome. And um, uh, we don't know who the other Houston Games and Carmen Foskies are going to be, but they're out there. What we have to know is that the Democrats have theirs too. I don't know who they are. Well, I think we're about finished up here. Is there anything that that maybe I didn't ask, or something that you know you want to you want to close out with? I think that there's a uh, a chance that the Georgia Republican brand will survive longer than our demographic destiny would suggest. And I think a lot of credit is due to the Republican leadership that we've had. We've been, even though we have an extremely conservative electorate, we've had pragmatic leadership from Johnny Isaacson and Nathan Deal and Sonny Perdue and David Ralston and Casey Cagle. And these are guys who have gone out there and they, they are conservative, they're able to talk to conservative voters, but then are able to steer the ship of state safely and toward prosperity. And it's paid off for Georgians. And it's not always sexy. It doesn't make for, it doesn't make for great mail pieces that you've got a AAA bond rating when no one else does. It doesn't make for great mail pieces that uh, Savannah River is seven feet deeper. Uh, <laughs> that we have put a new layer of asphalt on 85 as opposed to a new interstate system. But we have seen tremendous success in Georgia. Those things I mentioned are hugely important. The university system has gone from a backwater to a jewel. We are highly competitive on the national stage now. The kids who are in the the classes at Georgia Tech and UGA are miles ahead of where they were in the mid nineties when hope began miles ahead. It is a different world. And that is because the state has been well managed and people who aren't traditional Republicans know that they look at Nathan deal Beach and campus carry and riff and going, Hey, there's, there's this guy, this guy makes sense. I mean, he, he's, he's not crazy. He's, I don't, I don't agree with him or everything. He's too conservative for me, but kind of like the guy. And so I think that's going to be one of Nathan Dill's legacies is uh, he has helped our brand because we haven't had the, the negative national focus that's come from, from leadership in other states, whether it's Sam Brown back in Kansas, McCrory in North Carolina, or um, even Pinston, in Indiana, which ended up not hurting him in the long run, obviously, but... Georgia has been sensibly run, and that gives Republicans hope. It is a model to follow, but it's tricky because you have to continue to keep your most loyal voters happy. It's a hard balance, 
and it's going to be harder for us moving forward. Well, thank you very much, Brian Robinson, for participating in the Two Georgia, uh, Two Party Georgia Oral History Program at the uh, Richard B. Russell Library, at University of Georgia. Uh, I've uh, I've enjoyed it and definitely appreciate it. Thank you very much. You bet. Go dogs. <laughs>